Hi, folks. Let's get started. Uh, I'm Jacob Stein. Welcome, everyone. Uh, we still have people signing in, but that's okay. They'll fall in as we get started. Uh, so today we have a presentation on protecting assets from uh, personal guarantees. I hope you're all in the right place. Um, let's give the disclaimer. Um, so a couple of words about uh, myself first, uh, for those of you who are not uh, familiar with me. I've been practicing asset protection planning now for about uh, 20 years. Uh, we represent uh, everyone from some of the biggest names in Silicon Valley um, to some of the wealthiest families around the world in Europe and Asia and the United States, and on down to small sort of mom and pop entrepreneurs, real estate investors, doctors, uh, and the like. So pretty much anyone who wants to protect their assets. Um, All right, so let's get right into it. We only have an hour and it's a big, big subject uh, to cover. Uh, you are welcome to ask me questions as I go through the presentation. I will leave some time towards the end for some uh, questions that may come up if you do not want to ask them uh, during the presentation, but please feel free to either, well, I guess, feel free to use the Q&A uh, chat box to ask questions and I will uh, I keep it open during the presentation. So if it's a question that's sort of relevant to what we are discussing, I will definitely uh, tackle it and give you uh, an answer. So let's let's get into it. And uh, I guess the first uh, thing we will talk about it, what is asset protection? What is it all about? What are we trying to do? What is possible? What is not possible? And then we'll talk uh, the rest of the time much more specifically about how to protect assets from personal guarantee claims and why that's important uh, today. So asset protection planning deals with structuring your asset ownership, structuring your asset ownership in such a way so that assets are either fully insulated or somewhat insulated from uh, claims of creditors. And fully insulated versus somewhat insulated, that's a very important distinction, right? A lot of people, when they think of asset protection, uh, they believe that we have some sort of magic wand techniques that allow us to make assets completely unreachable by creditors. Uh, occasionally, that is possible. Right? Occasionally, we are able to set up structures which will make assets completely unreachable uh, by a creditor, whoever that creditor is. So usually, it is a plaintiff right, in litigation who is looking to obtain a money judgment but sometimes it may be a former spouse. Sometimes it may be some sort of a governmental agency, right? Like the Securities and Exchange Commission or the FTC or a local tax agency. So protecting assets is protecting assets. It, theoretically, theoretically, it doesn't really matter uh, who is that creditor that is pursuing our clients, but practically it does make uh, a big deal of difference. And we'll discuss that in, in a minute. So if making assets unreachable is not something we can usually deliver to our clients, what is the objective of asset protection planning? Well, the objective is to make assets more difficult and more expensive uh, to reach, right? To change the economics of the case, to place our client into a better negotiating position vis-a-vis -vis his creditors. And you know, having done this over 20 years, hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of engagements, I will tell you that usually that is enough. So usually even if our objective is just to make the assets difficult and expensive to reach, what we see is that in about a third of the cases, uh, the plaintiff or the creditor will just walk away and they will just not pursue our clients at all, which is the best possible result. Of the remaining two thirds of cases, uh, the vast majority of the time, uh, the parties will settle, but now they are settling on terms much more favorable to the debtor, right? Uh, and in about one to 2% of cases, we will see the creditors try to uh, penetrate the structures we have established, arguing that it's a fraudulent uh, transfer, what nowadays is called avoidable conveyance, or some other legal theory like uh, alter ego or piercing of the corporate veil. So one to 2% of cases. So our objective is to make assets difficult and expensive to reach. And that's really important to keep in mind because often as we go through different structures, 
right? Uh, either use a, a listener or our clients, if you're an attorney, will think to themselves, well, that's not a perfect structure. I can see different ways that someone can challenge that. And that's fine, right? Because again, we are not trying to create uh, a completely perfect structure, right? We are looking for the best available structure, right? Considering all the alternatives out there, what is the most efficient? What is the most efficacious way uh, of protecting our clients' assets? And that objective is really important in the context of protecting assets from personal guarantees. So this is something that we have a lot of experience with. So starting with the 2008 uh, recession, right? We back then represented several hundred business owners and real estate investors, real estate developers who have all signed personal guarantees on their loans and their leases. Um, you know, the recession hit them hard. Uh, a lot of those uh, business owners failed, right? And the lenders and the landlords pursued them on the personal guarantees. So, you know, over several hundred engagements, we've gained a lot of experience on how to represent clients facing uh, personal guarantee calls and how to protect their assets. So why is this unique? Well, if you look at your uh, universe of creditors, right? So for example, here on the screen in front of you, you can see that we look at different characteristics of creditors, like how aggressive are they as a creditor? How intelligent are they as a creditor? So a quick example. Um, usually when it's a live presentation and I will ask the audience, who do you think is the scariest creditor for us to go up against? Uh, the standard guess will be, well, it's the Internal Revenue Service, right? The, the federal tax authorities. Um, and you certainly do not want to go up against the IRS, but they will usually be like number five or six on the list of scariest creditors. And turns out that the scariest creditor to go up against would be a former spouse, uh, which should be like, once I say that, it should be kind of obvious, right? Not because the former spouse somehow has some extraordinary powers. For the most part, they do not, except for unpaid uh, child support or alimony. Uh, but usually a former spouse uh, emotionally, right, is very invested in the case, very invested about going after our client's assets. So we have a very determined, very aggressive creditor, right? The, the creditor that will do their due diligence, that will pursue assets to, I don't know, the ends of the, of the earth, um, so to speak. So it's important for us always to know who is the creditor coming after our clients, right? Uh, so for example, we've recently had a lot of clients we've represented that are facing uh, penalties from the US Customs and Border Protection uh, for anti-dumping penalties. Uh, and usually these are very large amounts, right? They're usually in the millions of dollars, uh, these penalties. But turns out that US Customs and Border Protection is while they're very aggressive and diligent in pursuing these claims and getting judgments against the business owners that we represent, they are then not very aggressive at all in collecting on those judgments. So I think the last I heard, um, US Customs has something like $2 billion of unpaid uh, anti-dumping penalties that they're sitting on, right? And if you think about it, it's a federal agency. There is no bureaucrat or employee at that agency who has a personal stake in collecting on the judgment, right? It's not like they pay their employees a commission for successfully collecting against our client's assets. So no one is really invested in the case, right? So knowing the, who is the creditor, knowing who is the plaintiff tells us how aggressive we need to be in response, what kind of structures we need to set up. So for a client who's facing a personal guarantee call, right, who is that likely creditor? Well, it's either a landlord or a lender. So uh, since April, uh, I mean, this, this has been since last April, this has been the busiest 12 months of my entire legal career, right? And almost all of the clients uh, we've been signing up over the past 12 months have been business owners uh, facing personal guarantee calls, right? So uh, restaurant owners, right? They assign personal guarantees on their leases. Um, Owners of beauty salons or sometimes professional services firms, right? They sign personal guarantees on their leases. Uh, owners and operators of uh, commercial real estate, right? They sign a personal guarantee to the lender on their shopping center. Uh, right now we're representing, for example, one of the largest private owners of parking lots in the United States. Uh, almost all of their parking lots are at airports, 
So you can imagine what kind of an impact that has had on their business over the past 12 months, right? They probably have uh, no revenue uh, coming in. And they have signed a personal guarantee, the two owners of the business have signed a personal guarantee on about $150 million worth of loans. So after operating this super successful business for 40 years, right, and just making lots and lots and lots of money, now these two individuals are seeing all of their personal assets, everything they've accumulated over their entire life, working their asses off, being threatened by, uh, by the lenders, right, by the creditors. So they're very motivated to protect their assets. And the creditors in these cases, right, these are often very motivated creditors and often very intelligent creditors, right? So this, for example, is not a plaintiff's law firm that is coming after a client. If, usually if it's a plaintiff's law firm coming after a client, we're not so worried about them, right? Because a plaintiff's law firm, you know, if we make it difficult enough and expensive enough to come after our client's assets, they usually will not be willing to litigate and, you know, launch fraudulent transfer lawsuits. It just economically does not make sense for them. But for, let's say, a large lender, right, they probably have either in-house lawyers or they have a law firm and retainer that does nothing but pursue borrowers on personal guarantee claims. So they're very experienced in making these claims, right? Uh, they are very experienced in um, uh, looking for assets and trying to breach asset protection structures. So that's a very serious, diligent creditor for us to go up against. Uh, likewise, a lot of landlords will fall into that category. Not all of them, you know, some landlords may themselves have like mom and pop operations, uh, but some are large national landlords uh, that again will have uh, law firms on, uh, on the retainer uh, that, uh, you know, would be uh, pursuing uh, this litigation, will be pursuing our client's assets. So knowing that, knowing that when we are protecting clients from a personal guarantee, that the plaintiff will be diligent and likely aggressive, it means that we, uh, in response to that or in anticipation of that, need to employ measures that likewise will be very robust, uh, where we expect uh, our structures to be challenged and they still uh, need to work. So in every asset protection case, uh, you know, these are on, on the slide that you see in front of you, these are the threshold questions that we always look at for every single client to determine what asset protection structure is right for them, right? So we are going to look at uh, who is our client? Are they married? Are they single? Is it a legal entity? Will the plaintiff try to pierce the corporate veil of the entity? Um, we look at the timing of this, like, so has our client already defaulted on their uh, loan or lease obligation? Are they about to default? Are they just planning for the future, right? How quickly will the plaintiff be able to come after them? Will our client be filing a bankruptcy? Is that a possibility? Because then the planning changes completely if they're going to be uh, filing for bankruptcy protection someday. Um, uh, we just discussed that, you know, who the creditor is, right? And their characteristics as a creditor, uh, that's important. And then we most importantly look at what are the specific assets we need to protect? What is it that the client owns that we need to protect. And this extends both to clients that are natural persons, right, and individuals, and to clients that are legal entities. And we very often will protect assets of legal entities, right? They may have also very valuable assets. So if our client is an individual, we will look at things like, you know, what does he own? Does he own a personal residence? If he owns a personal residence, which state does he live in? Is there a homestead exemption that will apply that will protect some amount of equity in their home? Uh, does the client have cash and brokerage accounts, retirement plans, rental real estate, intellectual property, art and collectibles, right? So all of these different uh, types, different categories of assets will call often for different types of structures or at least iterations of different types of uh, structures. So putting all of these factors together, that allows us to determine what is the right structure because there is no single one right structure to protect assets, right? If there was, this would be like a 15 minute presentation and we are done. Uh, there are a lot of different options. There are probably at least a couple dozen structures that we commonly use in practice uh, to protect our client's assets. And none of these structures are right. None of them are wrong, right? It's just different options that we weigh uh, to decide you know, what to do. 
Some structures are more protective, but perhaps more invasive on our clients, uh, more cumbersome. Uh, there may have tax consequences, right? So uh, for our clients, it's a bit of a balancing act. How much protection do I want versus what am I willing to do to get that protection? How much control am I willing to give up? What am I willing to pay Jacob to get this done, right? So lots of different factors are uh, in play here. Um, usually, and there's just one point I want to make on this slide, is that usually before a plaintiff can come after our client's assets, they need to obtain a judgment against our client, right? So they need to file a lawsuit saying, hey, uh, you know, you defaulted on your loan obligation. File a lawsuit, they get a money judgment. And once they have that money judgment, they can use that money judgment to pursue our client's assets. There is, so we, which means in a standard case, it's at least two or three years out before our client's assets are really truly in jeopardy, right? Because nothing can be done until the judgment is obtained. The one big, big exception to that are cases involving personal guarantees. So in some types of uh, cases and some types of litigation, a plaintiff is allowed to place a lien on the defendant's assets before they obtain a judgment. And these are cases where uh, the litigation arises in a business setting, where the claim arises in a business setting. So for example, a business loan or a lease of business premises, where the damages are easily ascertainable. And if you think about loan defaults or lease defaults, damages are easily ascertainable, right? We usually know exactly what is owed to the landlord, like what is the remaining unpaid lease obligation? How much is still outstanding on the loan? So usually when a case involves a loan or lease default, right? And especially if there's a personal guarantee component where our client's personal assets are at stake, uh, uh, a pre-judgment writ of attachment is available, which means that the plaintiff can file a lawsuit and then seek to place a lien on our client's assets. And as soon as that lien is in place, there is nothing that our client can do to protect his assets because there is no way to shake off that lien once it has been placed. So if we know that it's a case involving a personal guarantee, it means we need to move super quickly to get assets out of our client's name to protect those assets before the prejudgment lien uh, can be placed. Uh, one more note I actually wanna make on this slide. Um, so very often uh, people associate asset protection planning with hiding assets, right? Um, in hiding assets, when we're looking to protect them, first of all, it's not synonymous. But more importantly, it's not a bad thing to do, right? If we can make it difficult for some would-be plaintiff to find our client's assets, maybe they will never bring that lawsuit in the first place, right? Because they can't find any assets. We had this case, the situation recently, where we not just protected our client's assets, we camouflaged their assets, right? We really disconnected our client from the ownership of his assets. Um, so they received the, you know, a demand letter from a plaintiff's law firm. Uh, our client's defense lawyer responded saying, our client has no assets. And apparently uh, the plaintiff's lawyer did their own investigation. They tried to find assets. They couldn't find any assets in our client name. And you know, now about a year has passed. They've never been heard from uh, again. And we suspect it is because they've not been able to connect our client to any assets that he actually uh, owns. So hiding assets is not a bad thing, <clears throat> but it is not something that we can rely upon. First of all, usually it's really difficult nowadays to hide assets, right? We live in a very digital age. Um, everything is available, right? So certainly with respect to real property, everything that we do, every property that we have ever owned is traceable, discoverable, right? I can go on Lexus or I can go on my title company's website and in a minute, uh, know any property that any of you have ever owned anywhere in the United States, right? Take seconds. So ownership of real estate is public. Anything that we do today with re that real estate is also easily discoverable, right? It just stays in the chain of title. Um, and then on top of that, if the judge thinks that what we did is inappropriate, it should not stand, 
the judge has jurisdiction over the real estate and he can simply just transfer the property out of the structure that we have established and into the hands of the creditor. Um, so when we are doing asset protection planning, while hiding assets, again, we keep in mind that it's not a bad thing. Uh, we also uh, understand that we need substantive protection, right? We need to do something that if the plaintiff discovers the assets, right? At the end of the day, our client is pulled into what's called a debtor's examination, where he has to answer questions about his assets under penalty of perjury, right? Like we don't want to place our client in a position where they will have to perjure themselves. And so the, all of the protection that we do, all of the structures we implement uh, have to provide substantive protection. So as a matter of fact, we will always presume when we're doing asset protection work that the plaintiff will at some point discover and know exactly what we have done. And the structures we have established still have to work. So a little bit about fraudulent transfers. And I kind of kept this name for now because that's how most people are still uh, aware of what this law is. Uh, a couple of years ago, it was renamed into a Voidable Conveyances Act uh, from Fraudulent Transfers Act. And it, it's actually important, even though it seems like it's just uh, a, a min minor distinction, it's a very important distinction. The reason they renamed fraudulent transfers into voidable conveyances is because this old name, fraudulent transfers, was very confusing to people, right? Because it sounded like you're engaging in fraud by transferring your assets. And that's not true. Fraudulent transfer uh, was and is today uh, a term of art. It refers to a type of transfer that is voidable, that can be unwound by a creditor. It's nothing to do with fraud. Um, so they renamed this into Voidable Conveyances Act, which more accurately describes what a creditor's remedy is. So let's talk about this for a second. Let's say that our client comes to us and says, Jacob, um, you know, I have not been able to operate my hair salon for the past year. Uh, I'm going to default on my lease obligation. I still have four years left on the lease. Um, it's about a $200,000 liability remaining. And I signed the personal guarantee. So if we are now looking to protect that person's assets, right? We're doing this very last minute. Like he knows he will likely be defaulting on the loan which means that a creditor, that landlord coming after him one day will be able to argue that, hey, when you protected your assets, you knew that you will be defaulting on the loan. So therefore what you did constitutes a avoidable, uh, avoidable conveyance. Um, so let's talk about avoidable conveyances. It's really the only way or the only major way for a creditor to challenge what we have done. If there was no avoidable conveyances law, our clients can do whatever they want to with their assets and plaintiffs would never be able to touch them, right? And if you think about it, asset protection is a really simple exercise. It's a really simple exercise because all we are trying to do with any asset protection structure is to take an asset that our client owns and make it into an asset that our client does not own, right? Because if our client owns an asset, a creditor can reach that asset. And if our client does not own an asset, a creditor cannot reach that asset. And every single asset protection structure from like the simplest LLC to the most complex offshore structure aims to do exactly that, to take an asset that our client owns and make it into an asset that our client does not own, right? Every structure does that. And without voidable conveyances uh, act, anyone can just take their assets transfer them into the name of their family members, right? And the plaintiff would be helpless, right? So this law prevents uh, our clients uh, from making last minute transfers. So if that is the case, how are we still able to do what we do? Because, you know, frankly, uh, most clients come to us last minute. Most clients come to us uh, when there is already trouble on the horizon, right? There is already a uh, litigation or there is already uh, a claim that's been asserted or they just know that their business is heading, let's say, in the wrong direction. And there is a strong likelihood that at some point in time it will fail and they will default on some of the obligations. Well, 
we are able to do this for a couple of reasons. One is that it is extremely rare in practice that we will see any plaintiff or creditor bringing avoidable conveyances uh, challenge. Uh, this may be very different in the context of bankruptcy, right? In the context of a bankruptcy, when you have a bankruptcy trustee um, going after the assets, they will likely bring it in, you know, if they see transfers, last minute transfers like this, they will likely uh, look to bring either a preference action or a fraudulent transfer action of some sort in pretty much every case, right? And uh, bankruptcy trustees are sort of unique creatures um, in the world of asset protection because they're extremely, you know, well knowledgeable, they're, they may be very intelligent and they're financially motivated to aggressively pursue the debtor's assets. But outside of bankruptcy, right, the analysis is a bit different. Now maybe we are dealing with a plaintiff's attorney who does not know how debtor-creditor laws work or who may not be willing to spend a lot more money on pursuing assets. We may be dealing with a government agency, right? And in their collection manual, uh, they may not have uh, anything talk, telling them what to do if there is a last minute uh, conveyance. Uh, or people just don't want to take their chances. And they're like, we already spend a lot of money on litigation. We don't want to spend even more money litigating uh, a fraudulent conveyance. Uh, so let's settle with this debtor and we'll accept less money, settle the case and move on. So as I said, and you know, over the past 20 years, our statistics are that maybe in about one to 2% of cases, will we see a plaintiff or a creditor allege that what uh, our client has done to protect uh, her assets um, is a fraudulent uh, transfer. And then the other point I'd like to make here is that, and I'll give you one of my favorite client stories as an illustration um, of a point. So some years ago, we had a client who, she was an elderly lady. Well, I guess not that old, but she's 75, somewhat elderly, um, who to help out her son, uh, personally guaranteed uh, a loan obligation that her son took out to become a real estate developer. So her son decided to become a real estate developer. He had no assets of his own. He had no experience developing real estate. Uh, but this was at the time when, you know, you could much easier, uh, much more easily obtain a bank loan. Um, and mommy personally guaranteed this bank loan to the tune of $5 million. So when mommy guaranteed this $5 million uh, loan obligation, she had about $8 million worth of assets. Uh, three years later, uh, the son, you know, ruined all of his projects. They were all run into the ground and he just walked away, right? He had no skin in the game, no assets of his own. So mommy is now holding a personal guarantee that initially was 5 million. And now with interest penalties, legal fees is probably closer to 6 million. And by then her net worth declined from $8 million, I think to about five and a half million dollars. So she goes to a few law firms, um, I think in New York to start with. Uh, and all of these firms in New York say, there is nothing we can do to help you protect your assets. Uh, it's just too late. There has already been a loan default. Um, you have no defenses on the personal guarantee. The plaintiff will just come after you and, and we cannot help you. So our analysis was a little bit different. So we looked at it from her point of view. And from her point of view, she has a binary choice, right? And her binary choice is she can choose to follow the advice of these firms and do nothing. And if she does nothing to protect her assets, then what are the odds that she will lose absolutely everything that she has? It's about a hundred percent, give or take zero, right? Uh, so that's option A. Option B is that she chooses to do something to protect her assets. And that's something, you know, it may not be successful. The plaintiff may challenge that as a fraudulent transfer. And if they challenge that as a fraudulent transfer, they may be successful, right? And if they are successful, they may be able to unwind the transfer and recover the transferred assets. But think about that choice from her point of view. Option A, you do nothing. 100% chance that you will lose everything that you have. Option B, you do something to protect your assets and there is some chance, whatever that may be, uh, that you will get to keep them. So in her case, and this is one of the reasons I like this uh, case um, as, as a story for my presentations, 
is that uh, that bank uh, that was holding the personal guarantee, after they saw what she did to protect her assets, decided not to pursue her. And now enough years have passed, the statute of limitations has passed, she is in the clear, right? Because she decided to take an action and do something to protect her assets, right? Obviously we cannot guarantee that result, right? We cannot guarantee that a creditor will choose not to go after our client's assets. But we can guarantee the opposite result, meaning that if you choose to do nothing, you will lose your assets. Uh, as the great Wayne Gretzky used to say, 100% of the shots you do not take, do not go in. Which is just, I think, um, some great wisdom for life in general, right? <laughs> for anything we do in life, whether it's asset protection or anything else. But it's true, right? If we choose to do nothing, our odds of success are zero. If we choose to do something, our odds of success mathematically are infinitely greater than zero. Um, so that's our sort of approach on fraudulent transfers. Obviously, because there may sometimes be liability for lawyers, we will not take every single case that comes to us. We probably realistically accept about 40% of cases that come to us for various reasons. One of them being that it may be too late, right? And if it's too late, uh, there may be too much liability exposure for our law firm. Uh, and, you know, we would not uh, want that. Okay, so uh, I, I realized that uh, while we actually have listeners uh, in Europe and the Middle East on this call, uh, at least some familiar names in Europe and the Middle East, uh, I think the vast majority of the listeners are in California. So let's talk about uh, California for a second and some debtor creditor rules that are sort of specific to California. And one of them being the fact that California is uh, a community property state. And in a community property state, uh, when one of the spouses is sued, that plaintiff is allowed to go after all of the community property assets. And the reason for that is the following. Uh, under California law, community property is owned by both spouses co-extensively, meaning that each spouse is deemed to own 100% of the community property assets. It's not 50-50, it is 100% and 100%. Mathematically, it does not make sense, I realize it, but that's how the law works. It's a coextensive ownership interest. So now if the husband is being sued, what percentage of the community property assets can that plaintiff reach? Well, the husband is deemed to own 100% of the community property. The plaintiff can reach all of the assets that the husband owns. So all of the community property uh, is uh, in jeopardy. So for those uh, clients that we have who live in community property states, whether it's California or Texas or any other state, uh, one of the first things we will look to do is to terminate community property and make sure that each of them has separate property, right? So we will take all of their community property assets, we will divide them in half, right? With the wife having half of the assets, and the husband having half of the assets. So just by doing that, if it's just a simple mathematical division down the line, we've already protected and insulated half of the assets. Uh, but we do not stop there. Uh, we will pick and choose which spouse is going to get uh, what type of an asset. So, um, you know, some assets are, uh, some assets would require more protection from creditors. So maybe that should go to the non-debtor spouse. Some assets are easier to protect. So those will remain with the debtor spouse. So we're very, very selective how we apportion assets between the two spouses, <clears throat> so long as it's mathematically an equal division between them. By the way, guys, again, a reminder, if you do have questions, feel free to type them in or save them for the end of the presentation. That's up to you. But I'm happy to answer questions uh, at any time. Um, very quickly, um, so we do use entities uh, quite a bit for asset protection, uh, especially entities like limited liability companies and partnerships. Let me see if I, yeah, uh, I think we'll use this slide. So let's say that uh, our client owns, I don't know, real estate or a business in an entity that is a corporation under state law. Uh, 
oh, sorry, question came up. Uh, will the presentation slides be available to download? Yeah, so we will circulate the presentation slides um, and the CLE certificate to anyone who wants it. So um, if you do not receive it from us in the next day or two, feel free to uh, email us. Uh, Kim, can you please provide everyone with uh, an email address um, so they can request uh, the presentation and the CLE certificate? And then on top of that, we do have like, I don't know, 150 page white paper on asset protection. That's like super detailed, has all of the law cited in it. So if you'd like that as well, you're welcome to ask for that as well. And we'll be happy to provide that uh, also. Okay, so back to the slide. Um, so we have, oops, uh, we have a corporation that owns some sort of assets. It doesn't uh, matter what the assets are. Um, but our client, let's say, is an individual. He owns shares of stock in the corporation. And let's say that our client is being sued. Um, so if an individual who owns shares of stock in a corporation is being sued, what happens to the assets owned by the corporation? What happens to the corporation uh, itself? Well, it turns out that shares of stock in a corporation uh, are personal property. And like any personal property that we may own, a creditor can simply take the shares from you, right? So when we own assets through a corporation from an asset protection standpoint, that is not a good structure, right? So if we have a liability that's arising at uh, the asset level, right? Uh, that liability is going to go um, uh, to the corporation and will not penetrate the corporation will not threaten the shareholder personally, right? So we will have a corporate shield if the liability arises inside the corporation. But if the liability arises outside, right? It's a liability directed at the shareholder, that plaintiff will just take the shares owned by the shareholder. And now the plaintiff is the shareholder of the corporation. And with that, the plaintiff has uh, control and uh, um, control of the corporation. And, and all of its assets. So often what we want to do is we want to, instead of owning a corporation, we want to own a limited liability company. The limited liability company, just like the corporation will protect us from inside liabilities and usually even better because it's more difficult to pierce the corporate bail of an LLC than the corporate bail of a corporation. But what the LLC will do as well is the LLC will protect uh, the ownership interest, the membership interest, from attachment by a creditor, right? So for example, if our client is being sued and our client owns uh, an apartment building through a limited liability company, well, now there is a judgment against our client individually. And the question is, can that judgment uh, attach, take from our client, the membership interest in a limited liability company? And the answer is no, at least the, the answer 99% of the time. An interest in a limited liability company is not eligible for attachment. It is a protected asset. And usually given the choice, we would prefer to own valuable assets through LLCs than through corporations. So this slide kind of illustrates that if you do have an existing corporation, you can either uh, transfer the shares into an LLC. So now you own a membership interest in a limited liability company, or you can just take this existing corporation um, and uh, uh, converted into a limited uh, liability uh, company. Sorry, Kim, I think is not listening to me, so I'm going to type in her uh, email address in the in the Q and A. Okay, um, let's move on. So now we come to trusts, and we'll spend the rest of our time together uh, talking about trusts because trusts are really uh, the cornerstone of asset protection planning. Uh, trusts are really what asset protection planning is all about. Um, so why is that? So recall what is our goal with asset protection planning. The goal with any asset protection plan is to take an asset that our client owns and make it into an asset that our client does not own, right? And again, that's not difficult to do. You can give assets to your kids. You can give assets to the homeless man down the street and you will no longer own them. 
but usually that's not what our clients want to do, right? The sole reason they're giving away assets is just to protect them from an existing creditor threat, right? They're not really looking to give them away, right? They're not necessarily charitably inclined, or at least not enough to just give away all of their assets. So what our clients want to do is to legally give away their assets, but do it in such a way so that they retain control over their assets. They retain the ability to transfer the assets back into their name, and they want to be able to complete all of these transfers uh, without um, any tax consequences. And the trust is the perfect structure to accomplish that. So let's talk about why that is, and let's talk about different types of trust. So first of all, uh, there are two, primarily there are two different types of trusts. One would be a trust that is revocable, right? And one would be a trust that is irrevocable. The trust that is revocable is the trust that we most commonly uh, see, right? So this is what in the United States we call the living trust, which so many people have, right? Unfortunately, a living trust, the trust that is revocable by the set law, uh, provides zero asset protection, right? There, there is a statute in every single state in the United States that provides that the creditors of a set law are allowed to go after assets titled in a trust that is revocable. So we set up revocable trusts uh, to avoid probate, to deal with an event of incapacity, uh, to provide how and when assets go to our kids. But uh, a trust that is revocable gives us no asset protection. Uh, so every asset protection trust has to be an irrevocable trust. Uh, so that may be, first of all, uh, a scary concept uh, for some folks to place assets in a trust that is uh, irrevocable. So let's talk about that for a minute. So historically, traditionally, if you look uh, at irrevocable trusts, they truly were intended to be just that, irrevocable, cast in stone, immutable, unchangeable, right? Um, and that's, uh, that's very scary for uh, our clients, scary for everyone. Like no one wants to do something with, with their assets that is irreversible. Like today you want to protect your assets, but it doesn't mean that tomorrow, right? You still need that protection or tomorrow you still want it, or it doesn't mean that the circumstances will not change. So. Uh, with uh, with uh, irre irrevocable trust, historically, like going back 400 years, right, to whoever, Queen Elizabeth or whenever they originated, um, the idea was to just do something that is unchangeable, right? We place the assets beyond the reach, not of just creditors, not just the settlor, but also beyond the reach of the beneficiaries. And it's certainly still possible, and sometimes we still may want to set up an irrevocable trust to do exactly that. But certainly when our client is engaging in asset protection planning, and often when our client is engaging in estate planning, an irrevocable trust is just a tool. It's, not, it's never anyone's end goal, or very rarely, right? It's just a tool to get us to a certain result. So they do not want an irrevocable trust that can never be changed. So starting about 30 years ago, and then about 10 years ago, migrating to the United States, a concept was developed of how to keep an irrevocable trust realistically, practically speaking, revocable or allow it to operate exactly like uh, a living trust would operate like. And that is the, the concept of the trust protector. So a trust protector is an office that we created uh, inside uh, the trust uh, relationship. Um, and uh, in addition to the trustee, right? And we uh, gave this office certain very significant powers over the trust. Uh, so a trust protector can, for example, have the power to terminate the trust. A trust protector can have the power to revoke the trust, uh, which are, by the way, two very different concepts with very different uh, consequences. But the trust protector can be granted both powers. Uh, the trust protector can be given the power to change the trustee of the trust, to change the beneficiaries of the trust. Uh, to veto distributions, to force distributions, to change the governing law of the trust, to amend the trust in a wholesale fashion, right? So, and, and lots more powers. Uh, so we can give the trust protector some of these powers, all of these powers, right? And with the idea being that uh, the more powers we grant to the trust protector, 
the more control we retain over the trust in an indirect fashion. So our client, the settlor, the person who is transferring the assets to the trust, he can never be the trust protector, right? Because if all of those powers are attributed to the trust protector, right? Um, now our client has the ability to revoke the trust, to get his assets, and then there is no asset protection. So always the powers of the protector must be granted to someone else, someone other than our client. And usually that will be either a friend or a family member. Sometimes it will be a professional trust protector, like some sort of a trust company, let's say, right? But most of our clients prefer to appoint their friends or family members because if it's a friend or a family member, the idea is that while you legally cannot tell them what to do or control what they do because they are friendly to you, there is a good likelihood that they will carry out your wishes. And if they do not carry out your wishes, then we preserve for our client the power to remove the protector and appoint someone else as the protector of the trust. And ultimately, that's how our client can retain control over all of the assets that have been placed inside of an irrevocable trust. So in the United States, this has been a very popular concept over the past, I don't know, eight, 10 years. Uh, I don't recall the last time I have drafted an irrevocable trust and I probably draft at least like 50, 70 of them a year without using a trust protector. Um, I certainly have it for my own trust. It just gives us a lot more control and flexibility with respect uh, to, uh, to any trust. And I think it's a wonderful concept to use. So for asset protection, we definitely want the trust to be irrevocable. We definitely want to have a trust protector, right, to retain control. Um, we want to have a spendthrift provision, which I think is just a, nowadays a boiler, boilerplate provision you will find in any trust agreement. Uh, and you want to give the trustee discretion in making distributions, right? You do not want to have any mandatory distributions. Everything should be within the discretion of the trustee. And then finally, um, at least in California, we do not want to have what's called a self-settled trust. So a self-settled trust is a trust you set up for your own benefit, right? So if I set up a trust and let's say this trust is irrevocable and has a spendthrift clause and is discretionary, it is not a good asset protection trust if I myself am the beneficiary of the trust. The trust must always be for the benefit of a third party. So the, the children, family members, your poodle, whoever, right? So someone other than our client must be the beneficiary of a trust. Uh, right now we are drafting a trust for a client where uh, the client's limited partnership uh, will be the beneficiary of the trust. Um, so, sorry, we have more questions coming in. Um, Can a creditor, that's a very pertinent question. Can a creditor obtain a court order compelling the debtor to replace the existing trust protector um, and let's say appoint a receiver as the trust protector? So the answer is yes, uh, Ira. Uh, the answer is yes. And there's case law on that, uh, that has happened in the past. And I think that's very rare because this is still a fairly new concept, uh, but technically yes. And it has happened in practice. I'm aware of at least one case in Florida where that has happened. So certainly we place in certain provisions in the trust agreement to try to protect from that, right? So for example, the, our client's ability to remove and replace a protector is available only if um, our client is acting of his own volition and not under uh, court order. Um, and then in some trust, like for example, if we uh, are drafting what's called a trigger trust or um, an offshore trust, then we'll, we will provide that the trust protector can never be in the United States, right? We must always be an offshore trust protector. So we try to deal with that. Um, you know, theoretically the court uh, can ignore uh, those provisions, but we've never seen that happen. Usually courts will go out of their way to enforce uh, the provisions of the trust agreement, provided that they do not deem to violate uh, public policy. Okay, so back to self-settled trust. So in California, and then the vast majority of other states, I think in 35 other states, you can never set up a trust for your own benefit and have it be an effective shield against creditor claims. 
Um, so the question is, can we set up a trust, let's say in Nevada uh, to protect, uh, uh, to request, uh, sorry, to, to, to get the protection that we need for our assets and we can be ourselves the beneficiary uh, of the Nevada trust. Um, so the answer is maybe. Uh, if our client lives in California, if our client will be sued in California, if the assets owned by our client are located in California, especially if it's California real estate, uh, then likely a California court is just going to ignore the fact that this is a Nevada trust. First of all, the court will look at, you know, does anything substantive actually happen in Nevada, right? Other than the fact that you provided in the trust agreement that the trust is governed by Nevada law or that you appointed a Nevada trustee, uh, are there any assets in Nevada? Are any of the beneficiaries in Nevada? Like what's your uh, substantive connection to Nevada? And there's case law now that says that, you know, if there is no substantive connection, we're just not gonna respect the choice of law in the trust agreement. And also keep in mind that the choice of law we make in the trust agreement is only binding on the beneficiaries of the trust. It's never binding on the third party creditor, right? And if it's real estate that the trust owns, well, real estate is always owned by local law, never by the law of a different jurisdiction. Um, so I just think that in most cases, it is unlikely that if you have a California client or a New York client or a Florida client, and you've set up a trust in Wyoming, uh, or in uh, Nevada or Delaware or one of these other friendly asset protection domestic jurisdictions that, that self-settled uh, protection will apply. So in the time remaining, let's talk a little bit about uh, foreign trusts. Um, so it's a very similar type of trust. It's an irrevocable trust with a spendthrift clause with a discretion provided to the trustee with a trust protector. So what's the advantage of locating a trust like this overseas? Well, there are a couple of advantages. One is anytime you do anything overseas, uh, you are uh, showing to uh, the plaintiff um, that uh, you're showing to the plaintiff that you're very determined to protect your assets, right? That you're willing to do whatever it takes uh, to uh, protect your assets. Um, so, uh, you know, th that's very strong. And I will tell you that in the past 20, 20 years, we've set up hundreds of offshore structures for clients. I've yet to see any plane of a creditor go after assets in an offshore structure. Um, and it's not because we do something magical or wonderful, right? Uh, it's just plaintiffs are usually very reluctant to pursue assets or pursue structures that are overseas. The costs are very high. The likelihood of success is super low. The likelihood of actually getting the assets, even if you're legally successful, are very low, right? Uh, so it's just prohibitive to pursue assets overseas. I'm sure it happens, right? I'm familiar with some case law where that has happened, but it's extremely, extremely, extremely rare. From a substantive standpoint, we do have the laws uh, of some jurisdictions that make it even more difficult for a plaintiff to go after assets of over, over an overseas trust. So for example, our law firm primarily uses St. Vincent and the Grenadines uh, for our offshore trusts. And we've used pretty much every jurisdiction you can think of. We've used the Cook Islands for many years. We use Nevis and we still periodically use Nevis. We've used Hong Kong, uh, we've used New Zealand, we've used and still use Cyprus, we've, we use Hungary. Um, many, many, many years ago, we used those English uh, islands in the, you know, like Isle of Man or Jersey, Guernsey, what have you. Um, but for the past 15 or so years, we've been using St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And I'm a big fan of that jurisdiction for a couple of particular reasons. One, their trust laws are identical to the Cook Islands, meaning they're as protective as they can be. And for us, the most important aspect of these laws is that this jurisdiction where the trust is located will not recognize a foreign judgment, right? The, the jurisdiction will not recognize a foreign judgment if the judgment somehow affects the assets of a St. Vincent trust. So that's super important. So uh, St. Vincent does it, Nevis does it, the Cook Islands does it, right? Not recognize foreign judgments. They have all kinds of other provisions enacted that are very helpful, like a very short statute of limitations on a fraudulent transfer. Uh, requiring the proof of a fraudulent transfer beyond a reasonable doubt, 
uh, automatic under duress provisions and so forth. Uh, but what I really like about St. Vincent specifically is that this is not a jurisdiction that markets itself, right? It's not like the Cook Islands, which everyone associates with asset protection. It is not like Nevis, which everyone associates with offshore legal entities, right? It's a jurisdiction that's equally as good, but well under the radar. Um, so sometimes when we need to argue that we're just, you know, investing overseas or um, seeking other overseas protections and not asset protection, it is advantageous to have a jurisdiction that is not notorious uh, for asset protection planning. So final couple of minutes. So what, uh, what do we do when we have a client that is not quite ready for a foreign trust or may not yet today have liquid assets that can be transferred overseas to be protected by a foreign trust? But that need may arise tomorrow. Right, or we have a client today that is, uh, you know, doesn't want to have the tax filings associated with the foreign trust. But again, tomorrow he may get sued, and then he needs to escalate the asset protection from a domestic trust uh, to a foreign trust. So in th those cases, we will set up what's known as a trigger trust. So a trigger trust, some people, uh, from a marketing standpoint, refer to it as a bridge trust. Uh, but a trigger trust. Uh, is a trust that starts off as a domestic trust, meaning a US-based trust. And on some sort of a triggering event, and this can be an automatic trigger or a manual trigger, the trust will migrate overseas. So the governing law will change from a US state to some foreign jurisdiction that we have pre-selected. The trustee of the trust will be automatically removed and the foreign trust company will be placed in its stead, right? And then uh, in a wholesale fashion, uh, in a pre-written way, we usually will attach specific exhibits to the trust. A lot of the sections of the trust will be changed from what it looks like for a domestic trust to what it will look like uh, for a foreign trust. Um, and lately we've become big fans of these trigger trusts because it's a much lower uh, barrier to entry uh, for many clients. And it does allow them to wind up with a foreign trust uh, when the time is uh, ripe. Um, and I guess like in the final minute, um, retirement plans. So um, retirement plans are uh, like a big way, uh, big asset for our clients and uh, sometimes a big asset protection tool. So uh, how do we protect retirement plans? So we need to distinguish first of all, what kind of plan do we have? So we have an ERISA qualified plan like a 401k plan, a defined benefit plan, a profit sharing plan. Those plans are protected under federal law without any exceptions, without any limitations. Um, so long as there is a, at least one employee participating in the plan who is not an owner of the business, right? Uh, so that's, I mean, the best level of protection you can possibly have. The problem with an ERISA qualified plan is that it cannot be used actively as a tool, meaning whatever you have in the plan will be protected. But if you get sued, you cannot just take all of your assets and dump them into an ERISA qualified plan because there are significant contribution limitations on an annual basis as to how much wealth you can transfer into an ERISA plan. If you have a non-ERISA plan like an IRA, then it becomes very state specific um, as to whether the assets in the IRA are protected. In California, the assets of an IRA for almost all of our clients are not protected. In uh, New York and Florida, they're fully exempt. In some states like Nevada, it may be uh, like a monetary limit on compensation of um, uh, IRAs. So usually for IRAs, what we will do is we will uh, have the client set up a 401k plan and then roll the money out of the IRA into the 401k plan. So guys, I can likely keep uh, speaking for uh, hours on this topic. And sometimes I actually teach this as a full day presentation. There's just a lot to cover. Let me quickly go through a couple of questions that uh, came up. And if uh, you guys have more questions, if you've thought of something, feel free to uh, pop them up and uh, I will answer them. Uh, what are the comparative costs uh, borne by a client to utilize a foreign trust versus a domestic trust? Um, so usually with the domestic trust, there should be no annual costs because you will appoint a friend or a family member to be the trustee. 
you'll appoint a friend or a family member to be the trust protector and they're not gonna charge you anything. Um, if you have a foreign trust, you always need to select a foreign trust company uh, as the trustee of the trust. So most of them will charge, charge $3,000 per year. And then uh, you will likely also need a foreign protector uh, the one that we use charges $500 uh, per year. Um, the setup cost legal fees will vary. Usually you will pay about three to four times as much uh, to set up an offshore trust versus a, a domestic trust. Um, is there risk a qualified plan protection lost when all non-owner employees leave the plan and only the owner remains? I believe that the answer is yes. And I'm not an ERISA attorney, uh, but from my understanding, the answer uh, is yes. Um, based on your actual experience, generally speaking, how aggressive are title insurance companies as creditors in pursuing voidable conveyance actions to attack your asset protection structure? Um, so we've never had the experience um, and we are likely more experienced than any other firm in the country with this but we've never seen a title insurance company coming after our client. Um, so I just don't have any firsthand experience of answering that, uh, that question. Um, I think that concludes uh, the, today's presentation. Uh, thank you everyone for listening. If you have questions you want to ask more privately, you have my email address on the slide. I will always answer questions from anyone who's taken my uh, seminars, webinars, what have you. So just uh, feel free to email me and I'll be happy to help you. And with that, I'm Jacob Stein. Thank you so much, everyone, for listening and uh, have a great day.